Thank you, ladies, for that wonderful session. Let's all stand once again. We're going to take opportunity now to count our blessings. Count your blessings, name them one by one. When upon life's pillows you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, count your many blessings, see what God has done. Are you ever burdened with the load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly, and you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. So much he does and so much he gives that we are undeserving of everything that he has given us in his grace. If we would thank him also this morning for his faithfulness to us. You can count on him, you can rely upon him. Our next hymn is Great Redemption. <laughs> Ah! 
all God's people said. Amen. You may be seated. Well, amen. It's good to see each of you this morning. It's uh, good to be back among the living, so to speak. So I uh, appreciate the prayers for my family. Uh, just to remind you of a couple things, you notice in the bulletin, uh, this Wednesday, our service will be online. So we will not have an in-person service this Thanksgiving week. Uh, we know many of you will be traveling and being around family members, so we're going to take opportunity to do, hopefully, one last virtual service. Okay, I thought I'd get a little better response because uh, I'm really about done with the virtual services, but I'm sure, I'm sure I know there's people that can't. So, uh, But as a group, uh, this Wednesday we will have a virtual service on uh, Facebook and YouTube at 7 p.m. You can watch that. Again, we're glad to have our guests with us this morning. Hopefully the service will be a blessing to you. And uh, just as we, as always, uh, we just you know, at, hope that the Lord blesses you through the service. Uh, and of course, you can give online through graysonbbc.com or you can do out in the foyer. At this time, we'll have a good offertory service. The picture you're seeing on the screen is a picture of a man hiking the world's most dangerous hiking trail. This trail is found in Huxuan, in uh, the mountain Huxuan. Uh, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that right, but it's in China. And uh, Brother Richard, for the live stream audience, would you get a picture of that uh, picture? He is on a one foot wide plank that's been embedded into the wall of that mountain, 7,000 feet drop off. Uh, there are over 100 people a year that die trying to hike this trail. Now let me tell you, that is a dangerous path. That is a dangerous way to go. I'm, I'm going to sign up everybody and get us a, a plane ticket to go to Huxuan, China, how many of you are ready to go for that hiking trail? I'm not doing it. I'm, a, I'm an adventurer, and I'm pretty crazy, but that's not on my bucket list. Uh, that is a dangerous, dangerous thing to do. But, you know, spiritually, I see a very dangerous path that people are going down. I see a very dangerous road that people are walking on. Uh, as we see all the events of this year and the things that are happening around us and the trials and the afflictions and difficulties and pain that people are going through, I see them headed down a very dangerous road, spiritually speaking. And I want to talk to you about that today. The title of the message is The Dangerous Road of Unthankfulness. The Dangerous Road of Unthankfulness. Go to Psalm chapter 95, if you would. Psalm 95, 
And this psalm uh, that we're going to see today as our text for our message is uh, a psalm of two sides. It's a psalm uh, of two divisions. It's, it's uh, the front of it, the beginning of it is a polar opposite to the end of it. Uh, it's an amazing change that happens uh, in the middle of verse 7, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But we see in Psalm 95 that the first seven verses, David the psalmist, King David, is praising the Lord. He's being thankful. He is uh, singing praises unto God. He is uh, praising the Lord in the way that we should have. He has the joy and the rejoicing and the comfort in his heart that every Christian should have. Notice with me in verse 1. It says, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. I love that title. Jesus Christ is the rock of our salvation. He is the, the foundation of our salvation. Uh, it is the rock that we base all of our hopes and dreams and all of the faith on. It is Jesus that is the rock of our salvation. What a beginning to this psalm. Then he says, verse 2, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. You know, there, is no, there are no Christians in this world that shouldn't have about a million things to be thankful for. Well, preacher, you don't understand what's going on in my family. You don't understand what's going on with the virus. You don't understand my work situation. You don't understand this, that, and the other. No, I may not understand what position you are in your life right now, but let me tell you, every born-again child of God has a million reasons to be thankful to an almighty God that's been so loving and so merciful and so gracious to us that he would include us in his salvation plan. He says, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. Now, I've heard some of y'all come in the building and you make noises, but they're not joyful noises. <laughs> No, he's talking about the fact that every time you get to thinking about God, which should be all day long, that you just utter praises, you make noises, you make a joyful song. I tell you right now, I, I go everywhere I go and I'm singing something or whistling something or humming some tune, and I just want to praise the Lord all the time. Why should we come to the rock of our salvation and praise him and sing to him and have joy uh, because of him and we should be thankful? What does the psalmist say, verse 3? What is the reason behind all this? For the Lord is a great God. Now, if, if we had a competition between all the gods of the world, little g, made up by men, and God Almighty, the Jehovah God of the Bible... It's no contest. Now, we understand those are not gods at all. That's just figments of man's imagination and them trying to get the, the, the responsibility that they have to their creator off of their shoulders and put it onto something else. But let me tell you, if it was a contest, God wins every time. We have a great God. And the more, the closer you get to him and the more time that you spend with him, the greater he becomes. David said, for the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. You know, there's places in the earth that man hasn't been yet. One of the songwriters said that uh, in the ocean, the depths of the ocean where man hasn't plunged yet, man hasn't explored, that must be where my sins are kept. In his hand. Now think about that, the deep places, the mysterious things, the things that man has not figured out yet, those places that man has not been, they fit in the palm of God's hand. The strength of the hills is his also. You know, when you watch uh, the old railroad being made, and they have to cave through those hills and those mountains, Man, let me tell you, there's some strength in that rock and in those mountains. It takes a long time and a whole bunch of human ingenuity and sweat and work just to get a little bitty cave made through that mountain. Just think of the strength of the hills. Is his also. The sea is his. Now, that's a little bitty phrase. But think about that. God created and owns and sustains the sea, all of the oceans of the world. 
millions and millions of marine life and, and all kinds of plants and everything, and things that we don't even know are down there. Boy, have you ever seen some of those Discovery Channel things that get way down there in the depths, depths of the ocean, and there's stuff that comes up next to that submarine, and I'm like, whoa, that must be where they get all these alien movies from. Now, there's stuff down there that we don't know anything about. And all of that belongs to God. It's his. The sea is his, and he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, the psalmist says again. Let us worship and bow down. And I think that's the problem that man has. They don't want to recognize God as the creator. They don't want to recognize God as a great God because they don't want to bow down before him. They don't want to humble themselves. They have so much pride and so much human uh, knowledge and so much human experience and, and so much of these things that are uh, humanism and, and these other uh, theologies and the other false religions that are puffing up man with pride and saying, wow, look at what we've accomplished. Look at how smart we are. Well, I don't think I have to point too far to show America we're not nearly as smart as we think. Apparently, we have a difficult time counting ballots. It took like a week and a half for any of that stuff to get done. Man's not nearly as smart as he thinks he is. And he certainly doesn't want to come and worship and bow down before God. He says, let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. And that last two words on that phrase is the problem. Humanism has, evolution has. That's the problem that our society has. They don't recognize God as our maker. They try to convince you that we were made by accident, that it was just all a cosmic, some kind of cosmic uh, experiment, some kind of cosmic bang that went uh, just exactly right for us. No, he's the Lord, our maker. Verse 7 says, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture. Now, don't miss this. He is our God. Now, that does not mean, some of your mind already ran that way, he is our God. That doesn't mean that he's our butler. Doesn't mean that he's our slave. He doesn't mean that he's our genie. We don't rub on a bottle every time we pray and say, God, do this for me. Now you're my God. No, that's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about that. It's talking about that he is our God. He is over us, and he is a personal God. He knows everything that I've ever thought or felt. He knows how many hairs are on my head every day. When the 50 or 100 fall in the drain, and when the other ones get brushed out, and then when I got new ones, he keeps track of them every day. He knows everything that I think, everything that I want. He is a personal God. And when I say Heavenly Father in prayer, he says, yes, Brother Roy, what do you need? He's our God. He's not just some God out there in the cosmos. He's not just some entity that's around and everything. No, he's our God. And we are his people. You see, it's a personal relationship. This is not some supernatural being that just created everything and said, here you go, let's spin this thing around and see what happens. God is a personal God. He is our God, and we are his people. We're the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Now, up till then, we are on the mountaintop. We are like, wow, praise the Lord. King David, wow, what a song. Man, let's praise the Lord. Let's have joy, rejoicing. Let's sing a song unto him. Let's bow down and worship him. And then all of a sudden, this thing turns to a very dark place. In one verse, notice what the psalmist says. We begin to head down the, the road, the dangerous road of unthankfulness. Watch. Verse 7 says, For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your heart, as in the provocation and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Oh, wait, wait, wait. This is a warning, gigantic warning sign. I was running down the, well, it wasn't running, I was driving down the express lane over there in Fort Worth uh, yesterday. And for some reason, when you get in the express lane, of course, you're paying a little bit of money to go, you know, 80 
plus miles an hour. It's 75 mile an hour zone, but I, I'll take five, you know, five extra. So I'm doing 80 miles an hour down through this express lane, and all of a sudden, we come in to this construction zone, and all the other people from the rest of the highway are coming in there right around Hazlitt. It's got to be Eric Crawford's fault if you're watching. And I'm telling you, that thing shut down. Whoa! I mean, it was all I could do. There was a truck in front of me that was slowing down, and I went around him, and then all of a sudden, I'm, I've got a car right there. There were no warning signs. It didn't say anywhere, hey, the express lane is ending. We're about to go into a construction zone. It said nothing, no warning. And you know, there's a lot of people in our society today that have no warning signs about this. They have no warning signs to know. They haven't been in church. They haven't hear, heard the preaching of the Word of God. They haven't heard a message like this, and they have no idea the dangerous path that they are walking down. The psalmist says, not to harden your heart when you hear God's voice. As in the provocation, what's he talking about? When the children of Israel were in the wandering of the wilderness, when they were in the wilderness desert, after they had been liberated from Egypt, from Pharaoh, they, all the ten plagues, you know the story, they crossed the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness, into the desert, for four, what ended up being 40-year judgment from a God Almighty. They wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years. That's the provocation that he's talking about. So what did they do? Well, they tempted the Lord. Verse 9. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. You see, what happened was they kept saying, they kept complaining, and we're going to talk about that in a second. All through the wilderness wanderings, they kept complaining and complaining and complaining, and God kept providing miracle after miracle after miracle. They saw it and weren't grateful. They were not thankful. They just kept on complaining. And what it says here in verse 10 is absolutely amazing. God himself says, 40 years long was I grieved with this generation. Now that word means that he was disgusted. It means that he was nauseated. He was nauseated and disgusted and grieved by their rebellion and their lack of thankfulness. You say, well, preacher, it couldn't have been that bad. Uh, yeah, it could have. The Bible says that for 40 years, God was grieved. He was disgusted. He was nauseated for 40 years. Now, don't forget, this is God Almighty that is long-suffering, he's patient, he's merciful, he's loving, he's all those things in perfection. There's no flaw in those attributes of God. So what could a nation possibly do that would grieve God for 40 years? Well, they just kept complaining. And they complained, and they complained, and they complained, and they complained. And they griped, and they griped, and they griped. And you have to understand, it wasn't just one person for one day. It was a multitude, a nation full of people, with the exception of Moses and Aaron and a couple people. The whole entire nation of millions of people griped all the time. They griped on Monday. They griped on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Started over on Monday. Now, those of you that are in authority and in leadership... How does it make your day when a couple people come up and gripe about something? Now take that and multiply it by two and a half million people and let them do it every day for 40 years. And now you'll understand why God Almighty, even though he's long-suffering, merciful, loving, he was grieved. You say, well, what were they griping about? You name it. But just to give you a couple of illustrations, first of all, when they crossed the Red Sea and God did all the miracles to liberate them from Egypt and from Pharaoh, 
They got to the Red Sea, and they began to gripe and complain and say, What would you do, Brother Moses? Wasn't there any graves? Wasn't there any funeral homes in Egypt? you got to bring us out here to the Red Sea so we can all die. They saw the Egyptian army coming after them. Well, by God's power, Moses parted the Red Sea. They walked across on dry ground. As soon as they got onto the other side, all the waters caved back in on the Egyptian army. They were all drowned, never to see, be seen of again. They stood on the other side. Now watch this. The nation, the whole nation, Moses led them in a great chorus, a great song in the book of Exodus. They began to sing praises and glorify God. The whole nation, because they had been delivered and brought through the Red Sea. Not a week later, they come up to the bitter waters of Marah, and they have no water, and they're already getting nervous. They see a big giant desert out there in front of them, and they begin to complain again. Complain, 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 complain. God takes care of the water problem, and guess what? No singing. No praising the Lord. No gathering up the whole children of Israel. No gathering up the nation so we can sing and praise God and give thanks and worship him. No, 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 no. We went from there to getting out into the desert for just a little while. And they said, what are we going to do? We're going to starve out here. How could God have brought us out here? We had such great food back in Egypt. And so God began to put out there on the ground every morning manna provided their food. Then they said, oh, we're sick of manna. We don't want none of this anymore. So then he gave them quail. Oh, man, there's too much quail. We can't even do anything with this. They're everywhere. They're stacked up two foot deep. Man, what are you going to do? We want something else. A couple different times they go to the rock and they get water out of it. God blesses them with a stream of water, enough to give water to two and a half million people, y'all. And they say, oh, I don't like that kind of water. I like Ozarka. Well, I like Fiji water. Well, I don't like any of this water out of this rock. And they just complained and complained and complained. Go in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I want you to see this. Because when you start down the road, the dangerous road to unthankfulness, you begin to take for granted the things that God's doing for you. And then you cease to praise and be thankful to God. And then you begin to get away from God and you begin to sin. Verse 1 of chapter 10, 1 Corinthians says this, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And he's talking about the children of Israel in this time of provocation that is over there in Psalm 95. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat. And did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Now watch verse 10. This is very interesting. All the rest of the situations and sins that they committed, there were other things used in their destruction. But notice verse 10. Neither murmur ye, that's just an old-fashioned English word for complaining. It says, neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now, if you trace that word back to the Old Testament, that is the death angel that was sent out over Egypt that killed the firstborn. Who sent that? Who sent that, church? God did. God sent his personal execution angel to destroy the children of Israel in the wilderness because they were complaining. You don't think God was grieved? 
Matter of fact, God was more grieved. He got more personally involved in this than in any of the other circumstances. God does not want us. Look, church, look at me. Warning, warning, warning. God does not want us to go down the road of unthankfulness. You know, when I become complacent and lose my thankfulness and my gratitude, complaints begin to fly out of my mouth. They really do. And and statements like this begin to be made in your life. Well, that's just my luck. This always happens to me. It just always happens to me. It don't happen to anybody else. It just always happens to me. Oh, here we go again. And many other similar statements will start coming out of your mouth when you begin to be unthankful. Look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I want you to see verse 14. Look at how important this is to God. Verse 14 of Philippians 2 says, Do all things without murmurings or complainings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Can I just challenge you today, church? I think that the love of Christ that we have and we're supposed to share with each other, loving each other as a church and loving each other as brethren, is just barely paramount, just barely above the mandate to be thankful and not complain. Because let me tell you, if you're a church or you're a family or you're a person in this culture today that never complains and is always thankful, you will be a light to the world. You will be the best witness this church could ever have. Just by not complaining. Just by not griping all the time. Just by being complacent and content with what God has given you. Being thankful for what God has done. You see, there's another group of people that began down this road of unthankfulness. And I want, to see, I want you to see where they ended up. Romans chapter 1, they began down this same road as the children of Israel. And the Lord tells us and warns us again in even more stern phrasing and wording. He says, don't go down this road. Romans 1 verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now watch what they did. They began down the road of unthankfulness. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. There's your first step. Neither were thankful. But became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. And to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. To dishonor their own bodies between themselves. You see the road? Do you see the road? They they quit glorifying God. They quit praising God. They were not thankful. They stopped being thankful and grateful for things that God had done. And then they began to worship their own image, their own idols. They started making little bear and, and little horse and little animal idols and little statues. And they started putting them all over the place. They started worshiping the river and the mountains and all, everything but God. And then God got grieved with them. And he is grieved with them. This is still in the present tense as well. God gets grieved with them and then he turns them over to their lust. He turns them over to the sinful lifestyle they think they want to live. 
He turns them over to that going after money. He turns them over to that whole attitude of going out for bigger and better things and gear, grabbing everything I can in this life. After all, this is my life, and I'm going to live it the way I want. Verse 25 continues the road. He says, they changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up into vile, unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. We call it now lesbianism. And likewise also the men, leaving their natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one towards another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. We call it today homosexuality. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. To do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. And here's the last step. Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, they don't only do them, but have pleasure in them that do them. It's not enough when you get to the end of this road to be in a sinful, lustful lifestyle. It's not enough at the end of this road to be completely rebellious and disobedient to God and completely selfish and completely idolatrous. It's not enough to do that. Now you want everybody to join in with you. say well preacher come on now that can't all happen because we're unthankful i think we're seeing it in america right now you say well preacher man this has been a hard year boy i know well, preacher, we just, I just don't know what to be thankful for. Well, let me tell you, just clear off a spot. Get you some good gospel music. Read about four or five chapters of the Bible. Anywhere, you pick your spot. And just sit there and say, Lord, I don't know what to be thankful for yet. And God will tell you what you need to be thankful for. Even in the middle of COVID-19, I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for my church. I'm thankful for all my friends that have been praying for me. I'm thankful for all my friendships. I'm thankful for the finances that God's given me where I can go out and live a a comfortable life. I'm thankful for my house. I'm thankful for my car. I'm thankful for all the things that God's given me, but not just material things. I'm thankful for the peace that passes all understanding that's in my heart. And boy, at the top of the list that I could just talk about and did actually yesterday to the Lord, For a good long, long time, I'm thankful that he saved me. And he forgave me of all my sins. And he gave me a home in heaven. And no matter what happens in 2020 or 21 or 229, I'm on my way to heaven. And whenever I step out of this life, so shall I ever be with the Lord. Boy, if you can't find something to be thankful for in 2020, your thinker's broke. Now go back to Psalms 95 just for a second. You say, what do we do, preacher? I don't want to go down that road. Well, number one, take your eyes off of your problems and take your eyes off of your life and take your eyes off of your situation and put them back on God. Put them back on God. Spend some time this week just sitting down in a quiet place. If you've got to put those noise-canceling headphones on, then go for it. If you can't afford that, you got a pillow, do it. Block out the noise of this world. Block off the radio and all the TV and all the Facebook and all the social media. Turn it all off and get yourself out in a quiet place. I went all the way to Glen Rose, Texas, and out in the woods. You don't have to go that far. You can do it right in your house. Get in a a quiet, alone place with God and just let God speak to you. Be thankful 
and take your eyes off of your circumstances and put them back where they belong on God. Notice what the psalmist said again. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with songs. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his and he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Can you hear God's voice saying, speaking to you, comforting you? Can you hear God's voice in your heart right now, church, just encouraging you, trying to lift you up out of the struggles and the difficulties that you're in? Let me tell you, if you'll get along with God, get your eyes off the circumstances that you're living in and put them back on God and begin to praise him and make a joyful noise. And Hey, I don't care if you can sing or not. It just says make a joyful noise. If you get in there in your private place and spend some time with God and your heart will just swell up with thankfulness. You'll become so thankful, it's like Thanksgiving dinner. It'll just be coming out everywhere. You'll be full of thankfulness. And I want to warn you, church, it's a dangerous road to go down the road of unthankfulness. Do you think that hiker is in a dangerous place up on that mountain? He's got nothing on the people that spiritually are going down the road of unthankfulness. Would you stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed?